Welcome to the 20 Years of Morrowind podcast. Morrowind is a shared journey that we took on our own, and today we'll discover one such journey. My guest is Trainways, modder and game dev. Welcome on in. Well, it's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you so much for, for talking to us. And, uh, and so I'm very curious about what I poetically call the Morrowind journey. Basically, you, Morrowind, what, what happened? I was not actually the first person in my family to play Morrowind. So the actual, like the timeline basically is that my brother was a big fan of it and played it constantly. And at one point he shows me this game and is like, you should really try this game out. You know, here's a Discworld mod for it. And I was big into Discworld as a kid, still am. I was like, oh, okay, I'll check it out. And it took a while for it to click for me. I was I was relying on Firebite for pretty much the first five hours of the game or so. And it got me through a lot of the initial dungeons and stuff. Mm -hmm. And at one point I'm in the Urshalaku burial caverns. And I'm really mm -hmm. struggling because if you remember, there's skeleton champions there and Firebite just wasn't cutting it against those mm -hmm. guys, right? Yeah. So I, I'm walking around and I look up and suddenly there is an enchanted glass longsword, which is significantly more powerful than anything I've found before. And that's just kind of that, that feeling of discovery, that feeling of if I looked into a corner, I would find something amazing. Mm -hmm. Definitely sort of sold me on the game. But did you have the skill to swing that sword and hit anything with it? Well, no, but when I did, it did a lot of damage, <laughs> mm -hmm. and that's what really mattered. Yeah. Uh, so we, we have your, your family to thank for your discovery of Morrowind. Yeah, my brother was definitely the uh, impetus to get me into uh, Elder Scrolls in general. Trying so you can to thank him really... for the eventual uh, leading to Thomas the Tank Engine and all those horrors. Well, I, I was going to ask you, that was going to be my follow-up question. Did you start modding Morrowind because there were no trains in it? Yes. <laughs> but no, it was... I, I had... So when I was a kid, I had a really limited library of video games. And I was definitely trying to make that... Uh, extend the life of those as much as possible. It was definitely something I was into. I really liked quest mods for Morrowind. I was like, okay. Well, if this, this uh, stuff has included, I'm used to several other... Uh, like, game editors and stuff. I'm, I'm going to try my hand. And I started making dungeons and knocking out stuff and learning script. And that eventually turned into four years down the line. Later, that turned into my first ever mod, which was Deus Ex Machina, which was this big landmass steampunk mod that, of course, was all about trains. Yeah, I remember that. Oh, yeah. And uh, from the moment you started modding, did you stop playing? No, I don't think I ever actually stopped playing Morrowind or any of the games I've actually modded. I still enjoy playing them, especially I like to see what other people do with mods and designs, and especially things like Dungeons and Quests, just to see how they incorporate different things. I've seen a lot of tons of creative uh, applications of statics and other, uh, especially dwarven things, just combining mm -hmm. those in ways you wouldn't expect. Yeah. Um, so when, uh, when you were playing, are you the, the sort of person who would end up playing always the same sort of character, or did you sort of diversify and try different things, different builds? I... See, for me, it's never been about the build. I just like... I like to do everything in a game. I'm very much a completionist sort of uh, guy. So inevitably, my character will usually end up being good at everything. Mm -hmm. But usually... So usually I play some sort of uh, sp a spell sword or battle mage or some variation on that. Mm-hmm. Oh, and it's a well-rounded character. But my go-to race, of course, are always Dark Owls. I love the Dunmer. Makes sense. Completely makes sense. Um, what, what is it about the game that you, 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 you found interesting and uh, makes you still play it nowadays? For me, what keeps me coming back to Morum was always the handcrafted aspect of the world. I just... All the Elder Scrolls games have that handcrafted aspect, but for Morrowind, it's everything is there. Every piece of loot is hand-placed, you have far less randomization of enemies. So it is, it's always rewarding to me to go into a dungeon because you never know what you're going to find. Mm -hmm. And this is, I don't know if many people will agree with this, but I think there is something in the later games that I kind of call dungeon fatigue, which is a lot of them are really, really big. 
And after a while, there's this feeling of, oh my god, I want to get out of this dungeon. For Morrowind, you're so game-breakingly fast and powerful, and many dungeons are much more smaller, self-contained stories. And I actually like that mm -hmm. in Morrowind compared to the later games. I like to be able to go into a tomb, and it's two or three rooms. I can clear them out. There's usually something, maybe something unique about them. And so when you find the much larger dungeons, like, say, the, uh, the place where you get Skull Crusher, it just feels all the more special. Mm -hmm. I actually, yeah. like I said, I actually prefer to have those smaller, self-contained uh, stories compared to larger epic dungeons. Yeah, it's true that entering a dungeon, you, you could, based on the creatures that are there and the loot that, the loot that you find there, you go, oh, there, there must have been, I don't know, a summoner in there because there's some, some Daedra hanging it. And I found that weird book, maybe that was a necromancer. And it's up to you to sort of figure out what happened in there, even though you don't have a quest. Exactly. It's it's there's there's so much handcraft. There's so much to discover. I'm I'm big into exploration games, so it's it's definitely for me exploration of all the Elder Scrolls games. Morrowind's exploration is the best, and it's also the most rewarding outright in terms of gameplay elements. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Especially the fact that items, including unique, powerful items, are just there. <laughs> they've just been they've just been put there. And it's, it's for you to, to, to find them. Nobody sends you to go and get that incredible item. It's just sitting there in, in a ruin on a shelf or something. I, I love that in a game. If I, if I go into some place, I can actually find something unique. And unfortunately, the later Elder Scrolls games just really kind of drop that aspect. Mm. And and especially it's, it's Oblivion with the, with the level list. That was a bit too much. Yep. It's why one of the earlier mods I ever made for Skyrim was, of course, uh, Moro Loot, which is made all the loot hand-placed. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people always seem to take that the wrong way. They're like, oh, it's a difficulty mod. It's like, it's not a difficulty mod. It's an exploration yeah. mod. Yeah. But I can see how that could feel that way. Um, but that's a, that's a great mod to have. But because it makes it more special. Mm -hmm. uh, since you, you, you mentioned Skyrim, what what were your first impression of Skyrim, especially compared to Morrowind first impressions? My first impression of Skyrim was, wow, my mouse sensitivity is completely broken. I actually had to go out and buy a new mouse. <laughs> uh, but my second impression, I, it was like, uh, I've been playing it with the lead writer of Soft Seal Expanded, and we've been comparing notes and stuff. So there was, especially compared to Oblivion, there was a lot more handcrafted stuff to find, which I appreciated. It wasn't quite to Morrowind's level, which of course, was why we made uh, Moral Loot. But there was like, I think the thing we were trying to find the most was where the hell Keening was, because we both wanted to find Keening. Mm -hmm. But that was, uh, there was, it was like, oh, you know, this is this is bringing back memories of, of Morrowind with the exploration and, and starting off and trying to uh, get my bearings and checking every nook and cranny for something useful. Mm -hmm. But in the end, I think Morrowind definitely uh, won out. Overall, that's the game I definitely come back to more. Uh, on my most recent playthrough, we did a multiplayer playthrough. Me and my brother, we did the entire main quest in multiplayer Morrowind, and that was actually quite fun. Neat. Yeah, it's like play playing Morrowind with friends and, and family. That's a dream that a lot of people have had for years, and to think that it's actually possible nowadays, that's pretty insane. Oh yeah, it's 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 amazing the steps they've made. Like I said, people have asked me, it's like, oh, you know, how uh, how playable is it with it? Uh, is uh, TS3 MP? I'm like, I played through the entire, we played through the entire thing, and we only have ever had one hitch, and that was because when the via fear goes to cure you of Corpus, he actually casts the spell physically on you, so only one mm -hmm. player can get the cure. There's only one Nerevarine. Exactly. That's what it is. That's what it is. Yeah, it's even more friendly. The has to friendly. degenerate into a can oh, magic cancer monster. He's got a little <laughs> Yep. Was that, was that you or your brother? Uh, I think I got the cure because I was the server host. Mm. Privilege. Well, I'm glad you're, you're, you know, you're the one, so you're still here to talk to us. <laughs> exactly. Well, no, he's still, he's still alive. It's just that his intelligence is zero and his strength <laughs> is like 30,000 now. Really, really handy to have as a companion. Exactly. W way better than unfortunately, that. Unfortunately, he was playing as a mage, so it wasn't too oh. useful. Ah, oh. yeah. Well, something you'll have to think about for your next playthrough. Yeah, probably going to go through Tamriel Rebuilt really built next time I mm -hmm. hit up Morrowind. You haven't played with it yet? I, we've played with it a little bit, and I've always done the first 
uh, maps one and two, because I always like to check out Kemal, uh, Kemal Z, because that was one of my favorite uh, dungeons to explore, but I haven't mm -hmm. really experienced too much of the new content. We unfortunately messed up our load orders when it came to Morrowind multiplayer, so we didn't get to experience mm. uh, the actual landmass. It was glitched out. I, I, I might say something wrong, but map one and two, they're the very early ones, so even those recently have been reworked. Yeah, so it's definitely something I, I might want to check out. I might get a, a mod that actually makes me start on Tamriel Rebuilt and see how that goes. I can't think of a specific mod. There's a, you know, random card gen where you can spawn anywhere, which works. Um, oh, right. Uh, going back to, to uh, modding and modding Morrowind before before going back to Skyrim, what was the the your favorite mod that you've worked on? Do you have one? I know it's a terrible question. It's like asking a parent who's their favorite child, but... Um... No, no, much like a parent, I can easily choose my favorite <laughs> child. No, it was definitely Sothisil Expanded. That was, to yeah. me, uh, the culmination of all the stuff I had learned from my previous mods. It definitely felt like it was the best. There was so much variety of content, and we just worked so much on that, and development on it went so smoothly. So to me, that's still that's still my favorite mod I've actually made for all uh, the games I've modded, including Skyrim and all the Fallout's and stuff. That's my that to me is my magnum opus and also my favorite. Nice. How is it working on the uh, on Sothisil Expanded? Because it's a massive project. It was it was interesting. A lot of the stuff I didn't know if it was actually going to work out. We had pretty much all of it planned out and scripted out ahead of time. Uh, but it was definitely, it was definitely an endeavor into itself. Probably the largest thing was definitely making the city proper, just because there was, there's like some 350 houses I actually had to recruit four other people to work on interiors for that. Mm -hmm. And even now, I'm still not completely done with the development of it. We're working on a 3.0 pack for that, which will redetail the city. It redoes some of the quests in the city to be a little bit more uh, gross. <laughs> uh, nice. So we're changing, if you remember, there's the regi the residential district mm -hmm. at a quest line that was a little bit cliche and predictable, and we're going to change that less to be more about class warfare and more to be about a disgusting mimic invasion. There's going to be a great scene in that. If, uh, if you've played it all, you can remember there is at one point you're attacked by a vending machine. Vending machines will now be a presence in the game uh, in that quest line and will become more and more omnipresent, and you can actually buy and eat food from them before you realize they're a mimic. And then there's that horrifying question of, then what the heck did I just eat? <laughs> yeah, good question. Therefore. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, unfortunately, no time release window on that. We have a, I have another third party handling the detailing of the city right now, and I don't know when they'll be done. I uh, will just have to be patient. It's just the way it is, but that's exciting news. We're definitely redoing a lot of the puzzles to flow a little bit better. It'll be a little bit easier in some ways just because things won't be as obtuse and like I said it's it's all about flowing better and trying to make mm -hmm. things feel a little bit more up to date as no. part of the, as part of the uh, the patch one of its main things that's good news that's super good news and we'll we'll wait are we gonna talk about cliff racer recursion that uh, do you want to talk about it because it's a little horrifying I mean, the mod itself is horrifying but I'm wondering if there's a story behind it like what what crazy mind would come up with that mod? I think it was I think that was definitely I know it wasn't after I was in surgery and was high on painkillers. That was <laughs> not one of those. I think it was just a spur of the moment thing, because I previously used scripts to make cliff racers uh ten times their normal size. And I was like, what else could I do that's like <laughs> horrifying and sort of uh makes you know adds to the horrifying nature of cliff racers. And I was like, how about like a for some reason, there's always been... I don't even like the show, but it's lived rent-free in my head. There's, like, a scene in Yu-Gi-Oh! where mm -hmm. he does, like, some card combination where he makes, like, this little imp thing constantly just spawn more and more of itself. Mm -hmm. And there's, like, a line where he's like, oh, for every one I kill, two take its place. And I'm like, I did that. And unfortunately, that was a, a horrifyingly bad idea. <laughs> I mean, it's um, it's part of Morrowind history. That's what it is. 
So yeah. for, for people who don't know, cliff racer recursion is exactly what uh, Train with said. When you kill a cliff racer, two more cliff racers spawn. And, and there's no those, end. There's no end. It is it's, it's applied to every every cliff racer, so it's just uh it's endless. It ends when your computer goes up in smoke. Yeah, I managed I think I managed to get it about four thousand cliff racers at oh, this gosh. point before it okay. crashes. It's actually interesting to see because Morrowind apparently has some sort of max... Maybe it uses like a raise to manage things, but it has a max limit on the number of NPCs it can process. Mm -hmm. So after a while, you literally see some of the cliff racers just stop working. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've n I was never brave enough to, to use the mod. Like, I saw what it was, it made me smile, and I said, no, no, not, not even for fun. I won't do that to my characters. It's uh, it's definitely a novelty mod you install one time. Yeah, because <laughs> you can't you can't play otherwise unless you mm -hmm. you got invisibility. Moving on to modding Skyrim, how how different was it from modding Morrowind? What was your experience? What did you do? I know there's trains, but <laughs> tell us everything. Well, a lot of the workflow for level design is the same. It, they've added a lot more to it. I actually, I know they're going to boo me, but I prefer modding and just making levels Skyrim to modding Morrowind because there's a lot of quality of life things there. You can hide individual objects. Mm -hmm. You can actually see the individual axes as you're, you're moving on, and there's, there's more Kiko commands. Uh, there's a thing called Quick Swap, which is if you hold down uh, I think it's like control, shift, and mouse wheel. You can easily swap out uh, yeah. objects on screen for another object, so it's really good for quick detailing. Mm -hmm. It feels like it's a lot more enjoyable, or as you say, quality of life improvements. Exactly. But in return, the dialogue system, I would definitely prefer modding dialogue and quests in Morrowind. It's a lot mm -hmm. more simple in some ways. Mm -hmm. You don't have to... in, in Skyrim, it's definitely there's more flow charts and you have to individually script stuff and it always compiles scripts every time you close. So there's like a three second delay. Mm. So there's a trade off in some ways. Uh, I was told that the construction set that is probably not called that for Fallout was uh, even better in terms of quality of life improvements. Yeah, so a lot of quality of life improvements, we actually, when we I worked for the Creation Club for Bethesda directly, uh, we kind of, uh, you know, we're twisting their wrists like, hey, can you backport some of these features into Skyrim CK? Because they're just so much more, it makes it so much more useful to use. So the quick swap thing is actually from Fallout 4 originally backported to the special edition creation kit. Nice. For those express purposes. Okay. No, no chance that they would do that for the Morrowind construction set. I don't even know if they have the source code for that anymore. They might, but no. there's, always, there's always the chance that we can mod it or OpenMW can uh, put that into their editor. Yes, uh, the the Open OpenMWCS is um is is work in progress. Uh, but there's hope. Well, it's definitely, there's hope. Definitely a feature to consider. Do you have a favorite Skyrim mod that you've made? So the sequel to Sothisil Expanded for my, was uh, Wheels of Lull, and that mm -hmm. was definitely my favorite mod for Skyrim, Similar for similar reasons as to why Sothisil Expanded is my favorite mod from both Morrowind and General. So you've modded uh, Morrowind, Skyrim, Fallout. Has uh, modding influenced your life? Oh, very much so. Modding, I think, is the reason I have a career as a game developer at all. And mm. on top of that, uh, it's definitely it's definitely brought me fame and recognition that I wouldn't have otherwise expected to have. Especially, of course, the claim to fame, biggest claim to fame is the Thomas the Tank Engine one, but <laughs> that's its own uh, mess, as it were. But for me, modding has definitely held a special place in my heart. I don't think I've abandoned it completely. Uh, for Skyrim's 10th anniversary, well, obviously we have the third edition of Soft Steel Expanded, and then for the 10th anniversary of Skyrim, I actually learned how to animate and released a whole animated train top battle for that that turned out quite well. Neat. How about you tell us a little bit about the game you're working on? So the game I'm working on is called Underspace, and I describe it as an open-world Lovecraftian space fighter RPG. And I know that's a mouthful, so the basic, but the basic, the basic premise 
is that in this strange galaxy, whatever allows you to go faster than light travel also creates these storms, hyperspatial storms that blow across the galaxy. And anywhere they hit, they spew forth anomalies and monsters and just generally warp reality and cause things to become weird. So you are a government contracted storm chaser and monster hunter whose job it is, is to go inside these storms to clear it out and make it safe for settlement and passage. And that's the basic premise, but it's mostly an excuse to send you across the galaxy to do quests, build up your character, get better ships, get better equipment to take on stronger challenges. And it's like I said, it's an open world RPG, so what you would expect in sort of an Elder Scrolls game is sort of what you can expect here. We've got the points of interest, mm-hmm. we've got hidden bosses, we've got space dungeons, we've got tons and tons of quests, we've got different factions. So it's generally, it's a, it's a massive, massive game. Easily, easily you could get 100 hours out of it just from the sheer amount of stuff. And there's, there's, everything is handcrafted. If you're going off the beaten path, you're going to find like some new jump hole, some like strange anomaly. Maybe you can find like the wreckage of a huge battleship and you can loot that. Uh, you can find, you know, smaller wreckage and you can get that and get some equipment that you could repair into stronger equipment. There's, there's just a ton of content and it's, it's been about, Five years of development. We're hoping to release it this year. Mm. And like I said, it's 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 extensive. It's I'm very proud of it. And it's like I said, it's a single player game with its own campaign, but it's also got uh, online multiplayer and co op. And then it's it's just got a lot, a lot of stuff. So it's called Under Space. And please check it out. I think if you're a fan of Morrowind, you will definitely like it. It sounds like it. Something that would be really interesting if you like. Open world RPG, open space RPG, I go so, at that point. If you like, if you like role playing games, if mm. you like space games, if you like action games, if you like multiplayer games, it's got something to appeal to you. And if you like trains, we have a lot of trains. It there are space trains, there are space ghost trains. Uh, there's a giant ancient space train that's a hazard in some storms. You gotta be careful not to let it hit you because it's the size of a planet and it goes really, really fast. <laughs> I actually remember some of some of the screenshots you shared on Twitter. Oh yeah, we're not hurting for trains in under space. Don't worry, I haven't <laughs> forgotten my origins. You, you were you were making space for the possibility to add mods to under space. Oh no, more uh, under space will actually launch with modding capabilities. It'll be a little rudimentary. You'll be able to add new ships, modify existing ships, and then do the same with equipment. Mm-hmm. But as time goes on, the goal is eventually to have a full modding suite that allows you to basically add, to some extent, everything that we as the developers add. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's exciting. At the same time, coming from uh, from the the, the Bethesda modding scene, it would have been a bit disappointing if if your game didn't make space for mods. Oh yeah, like I, it's where I came from, and I can't forget where I came from. It's a it's a really large project that you've been working on for more than five years. How do you keep yourself motivated? So it's definitely it's switching up diversity of content and basically changing what you're doing when you get burned out on something. So if I'm working on content or quests and stuff and that gets boring, I'll switch over to making it so that I am working on code or adding some coding and some new features. Or in some cases, I might start uh, texturing or modeling something new for that. Mm. So it's definitely, you have to switch it up, otherwise you will go insane. Makes sense. There, there will be the, the links in the, in the description, so people can take a look and check it out. Especially if the release is planned this year. Really fingers, fingers crossed on that. Fingers crossed. It's... Uh, we're, making, we're making good progress now. Like I said, we recently just finished up about... Half of the side quests are now implemented, and that only took a very short amount of time. So, like I said, we're hoping to release this year, and it's it's perfectly doable at this point. We're we're in the final stretch, as I say. Nice, excellent. Now, you, you know when uh, when you make a mod, or let's say when most people make a mod, they have an idea and they start working on the mod, and then it blows out of proportion. Did the same happen with your game? Is it now more than what you had imagined when you first started out? Uh, I don't know if I should admit this. It's actually less than it started out. I am, whenever I make a mod or a game or anything in general, I define the scope and the features pretty much 
from the get-go. I'm very much not a guy who does feature creep in any sort of way. Post-release for some stuff, I start adding things and trying to do stuff. So Underspace has largely remained the same game with the same goals as it was when I started it five years ago. That hasn't really changed. I've had to scale back one or some minor features or some story elements that were too complicated to do mm -hmm. and that just didn't work. But largely it's remained the same scope, the same amount of systems. And like I said, nothing's really scaled back or scaled up. Some stuff has changed. Uh, and I think, like I said, the one feature I'm always, I've been really sad to remove is I wanted players to be able to put decals on their ships, mm -hmm. like little uh, pictures of like a, like an insignia or something. And unfortunately, yeah, customize. that, that was not working out. So as a trade-off, I've been trying to redo it so that, uh, ships will have a, an Elder Scrolls Online kind of, uh, dyeing system where you can divide, uh, where you can paint or colorize individual pieces of the ship with mm -hmm. much more customization there. And that will be hopefully work out pretty well. You know, I don't think it's a bad thing. It, it just, it just, for me, it just means professional. You set out to do something and that's what you do. I think it's a good thing. Oh well, yeah, well, the problem with a lot of these space games, I won't name names, but it does rhyme with car kittison, have a lot of problems where they ridiculously overscope and have too much feature creep. So from the start, this game was no feature creep. What Define the scope, fill that scope, and then on post-release, start adding tons and tons of stuff. Mm -hmm. If it sells well enough, we've definitely got some fun plans there, of course. Okay, you heard it, guys. Buy it. Buy it when it's out, so we can see Buy those fun plans. Buy it, and it'll the ability to construct your own stations. Oh, yeah. That's, that would be really neat as well. Let's go back to Morrowind for a bit. I'm sorry, it's all over the place. But going back to, to Morrowind, can you recall more experience, memories, things happening, things that you weren't expecting? Well, uh, I think I think every player can relate to this. After I had, so the usual Aku Burial Caverns, after I had done that, I had to get back to civilization and I didn't know how. I was lost and I had at that point the Boots of Blinding Speed, but I didn't know the secrets as to how mm -hmm. to actually resist the Boots of Blinding Speed. Mm -hmm. So I was, I think it was up in Shiogarod, and I got traced by like six or seven cliff racers, and they followed me literally halfway across the continent. And I, to outrun them, I put on the Boots of Blinding Speed, but I was completely blind. So this was literally me running completely black screen halfway across the continent with seven cliff racers trailing behind me until finally, I think I stumbled into Sadrith Mora and the guards finally took action and killed them. Saved your life right there. Yeah, Boots of Blinding Speed must have. Pretty uh, much. There's, a, there's actually a few mods that uh, increase the strength of the blind effect, so it's not so easy to get the speed without being blind. Oh, I didn't realize it could go past 100. Interesting. So it's a lot harder or you, you need to have much, much greater resistance to magicka i mean the secret nowadays of course is that you create a uh a 200 resist magic spell that lasts for one second cast mm -hmm. it pause mm -hmm. and then put on the boots of blinding speed yep that's that's how it's done it yes. did is he uh he's making a range from like one to 100 percent resist magic and just take it on and off and put it on over and over again until it rolled a proper uh a good magic resist for that and then never took it off again but what if they get damaged? Because the, the, dur the durability is really crap on them. That's, that's the problem. But if he has... It was a constant effect magic for uh, the jewelry you put on to resist the actual mm. blinding effects, I think. Mm. Oh, yeah. That, that would do, that'd do it. Part of uh, the fun of Morrowind, like, different people love it for different reasons. There's the exploration, and I understand that that was something important for you. Um, mm -hmm. And there was also, because we're talking about the Boots of Blinding Speed, there's also exploiting the game. It's not cheating, it's taking fully advantage of the game and, and how it's done. Is that something that you've done as well? Oh yeah, I, I love... Morrowind to me is a game where it's really hard not to become overpowered. It's definitely... it's a game that wants you to exploit it. And it's also Oblivion less so, Skyrim yes, the definitely... When it comes to a Bethesda game, it is definitely figuring out how to become as overpowered as possible, while also trying to still stick to your build. Mm -hmm. So, alchemy, 
going for those OP item, you know where they are, that sort of thing. Exactly. Actually, I have one last question, but it's a big one. If you could make your Elder Scrolls cocktail, like which elements of each game would you take to make the ultimate Elder Scrolls game? So for me, I would take uh, a lot of Oblivion's fun with physics and mm -hmm. its quests in some ways. Oblivion still had some of the best quests just in terms of variety and things to do. I think most people kind of agree, for example, that the Dark Brotherhood mm -hmm. whodunit quest where you have to uh, silently murder people inside a mansion is probably one of the best quests, if not the best quest, made in an Elder Scrolls game. Mm -hmm. From Morrowind, I would take the variety of art direction and weirdness, mm -hmm. as well as its hand-placed loot and its potential for exploitation. And then in terms of Skyrim, I would take a lot of its systems for combat, particularly magic, because that flows a lot better. Uh, and probably a few more of its AI improvements and stuff. So it's definitely, to me, Skyrim's definitely kind of in between Morrowind and Oblivion in terms of, like, just everything. Mm -hmm. So it's like, there's not too much I'd actually take from Skyrim, because a lot of the stuff I'd take from Skyrim is already present in Morrowind. Mm -hmm. I think the most I'd take from Skyrim is probably its editor. It's probably what? Its editor. It's editor, yes. Um, and, and then you, you can even throw in some Fallout bits if you want. Hmm. Well, if we're talking Fallout, I can I at least pick Fallout New Vegas, because I'd love to have all the sheer amount of dialogue from that. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely take Fallout New Vegas' uh, amounts of dialogue and acknowledgement of character choice, as it were. Mm -hmm. Well, that that make a pretty good game already. Oh, yeah. All right. That's definitely... Definitely what I would want to see in an Elder Scrolls 6 when it comes out in 10 years. Do I just have to go and tell Bethesda about it? <laughs> so here's the recipe for the perfect Elder Scrolls game. I'm going to leave that with you. Exactly. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, the perfect recipe also has to have trains in it, but if, sadly if not yet. If the Dwemer are back or still there because we don't know when it's taking place, eh. Who knows? Well, I mean, as everyone knows, it was it was Rem and Sirida who had the horrifying screaming trains. Hmm. Yeah. Sl slim chances of train, but who knows? We might be surprised. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, exactly. Um, train Wiz, is there anything we haven't talked about that you wanted to talk about? Not really. We've covered most of the broad range of subjects and stuff. I was I was hoping to get that cliff racer story in, of course. That's the one <laughs> I always like to tell. But I think we've covered everything. Uh, well, if we think of something else, we'll have to we'll have to get in touch and talk again. Yeah, feel free. I, my door is always open. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you so much for uh, talking to us and uh, and sharing your your Morrowind journey, as it were. Best of luck with the on the space. I'll Thank be you. I'll be checking things out, waiting for it to come out. Until then, uh, best of luck with everything. Thank you.